why do I believe, you know, what I believe. I literally write down every, every single day. I sort of, you know, nice recent, you know. I don't know if you can see it. You know. So. Um, yeah, it's just every single day, you know, I, I write down, you know, I'm, I'm the um, best in the world and I'm going to be an Olympic champion because I, like, if I really believe in it, you know, I've got to start saying it. You know, every single day I write it down. You know, every single day, and you know, one day it's it's uh, it's not gonna pay off. You know, like, I I really believe in it. And I, I don't say it, you know, to make myself feel better or try to convince anyone. Like this is just what it is. You know, and if I really believe it, I want to put it. I want to say it out loud. I want to put it pen to it you know, on paper. And it's like I said, it's only a matter of some time before this this actually happens. You know. And it's not only my um, destiny to obviously do this or my goal or what I'm made for. Like I said, I've got a lot of people who I, who I, who I can't let down. Like, because they're like my dad, who's made like a massive effort. My boss, who's made like a big effort. You know, Gogo, who made a big effort. Like, all these people, you know, who believed in me when no one else did. Like, it's, um, you know, it's just my way of paying them back. I started wrestling when I was eight years old. My first competition was in 2006, where I came third in the British Novice Championships. I knew literally from the first day I walked on the mat. The goal in wrestling and also the goal in life of what I feel like my purpose is on this planet is to be world Olympic and European champion. Um, the odds are always against me, but I don't use that as a disadvantage. I, I use it to motivate me, to push me to the very end, you know, to make my way to the top. I mean, from where my family come from, I mean, my dad was world schoolboy champion, my granddad was multiple national champion, Iranian champion, and was told, I was told he won and wrestled in the Olympic Games, so I had that, you know, in, in my blood anyway. But I kind of want to set my own trends and, you know, carry my own name. I mean, this, this stuff is great, and I'm glad I have all of this un underneath me and behind me, but, you know, I want to be the, the a new generation, you know I mean? Like, um, my dad tells me I'm, I'm a fifth generation wrestler, I mean, that's how far back wrestling goes in my own family, but I want to set my own style and, and my own way of uh, sort of doing things. So I am appreciative of what they've done um, and, it, and, it, and it makes me feel good. But the downside is, is I've got a constant expectation I have to reach and now like, I kind of want to do my own thing, you know. Um, I've had some pretty bad injuries, but I think the biggest down I had, believe it or not, was when I went to the Commonwealth Games. Um, so during that time, um, I had to literally um, before the Commonwealth, I had to work for six months and train for six months because I wasn't like a, a sponsored athlete, so I literally had to pay for all of my own stuff. Even when I went to the Commonwealth, when I got a bronze medal, I literally came off the podium and I felt like I was on top of the world and I got literally dragged immediately back down. Um, I literally thought after I got my medal at the Commonwealth, I'd go on to be a full-time athlete and never have to work in my job. Um, would just be to wrestle full time when in the end I just got given £500 for my federation and like a, a pat on the back and then literally um, a week after I flew back from Australia where the Commonwealth was I was working as a doorman of, of bars and a restaurant so I literally couldn't have been up here to immediately uh, back down there. So I'd probably say believe it or not um, which was one of my biggest achievements is the Commonwealth but that's also the biggest uh, low I've ever felt um, coming down from, from that, uh, that medal. and I was never selected to go to the national team. Never ever selected. Um, the National Academy is in Manchester, so basically all of the rest is mainly up north, and because I'm from London, there's a little bit of politics between north and south. I was never selected once 
for any internationals, national training. Then when I got to high school, I was just I was getting sick and tired of thinking, you know what? Well, I'm winning my nationals every year. I'm seeing the same people. Why can't I wrestle international and be close to, to becoming the uh, best in the world? So every um, international sports federation has some sort of international uh, a governing body. So ours is United World uh, uh, Wrestling, but at the time it was called FILA. Um, so what I did is I went on the UWW or FILA, FILA website, found every um, uh, national governing body's uh, email in uh, Europe, emailed all of them my story saying, you know, my name is Cyrus Islami, you know, I wrestle at 76 kilos, I've won the nationals every year, um, I, I haven't been able to compete internationally, if there's any way you could help, if you have any training camps or competitions, can you let me know? Emailed every single country in our Europe, um, three countries, no, four countries got back to me, uh, Finland, uh, Russia, Spain and Belgium and the best offer I got was from Finland and the offer I got in Finland they said look um, we have a, a, a training camp for, for two weeks and they said come and train with us for, for free for two weeks in a, in a little training camp after for two weeks we're then competing in a, in a small competition and um, this what makes it more interesting is the national coach of Finland, who's my coach now, is a guy called Gergo Wola. So for those two weeks, he was coaching me and teaching me how to train. He goes, you know what, you're actually really good. Um, if a federation isn't going to select you or help you, um, here's, here's my contact stuff. Fly to Finland and I'll drive you to all these competitions we usually go to. You don't have to worry about paying. Just help us towards the fuel. I just in, in return, just let me um, you know, help you and I'll teach you. Um, so after that, it was because of uh, uh, Gergo Walla, I got to compete all around Europe. And because I was meddling and winning a lot of tournaments in Europe, then I then actually got invited to wrestle for Wales, not even for, for Great Britain. Um, and that makes it interesting. So I started wrestling for, for in Wales. And then with Wales, I, I went to a tournament called the World Festival Games. Um, and I got third in that also. And then after the uh, tournament, the national coach of Wales, which was like, uh, you know, bearing in mind, I worked my ass off to get that bronze medal. He was like, yeah, Sid, you're a shit wrestler. I don't think you're very good. I don't think you have a bright future. You know, I think you, you, you perform terribly. So I didn't say anything. I was like, you know, if that's how you feel, that's fine. Okay, whatever. So I only got invited into the national team because Gergo took me to all these tournaments and trained me to win in the international. It's, it's hard because my, my family have contributed so much to British wrestling, so much. Um, our history is rich with Team GB and wrestling. Not just my dad, my uncle, myself, my cousin, my two sons, my other cousin. Um, but if I go even from my dad and my uncle um, and the work that they did with Team GB, the endless medals that they brought in, the, the, the teaching, the coaching, I mean, it was the fitness coach in the era probably not old enough to remember, but people like Daley Thompson and Tessa Sandersted and when G Team GB used to train at Crystal Palace, I remember being there all the time as a kid. You know, he was a fanatical fitness athlete who was determined to always be at his peak and he was at his peak all the way up until 39, which is very rare for a wrestler to be at that age, um, to still be competing with sort of seniors and not veterans. Um, I myself served as a chair of the region. I've been on the board of directors of British Wrestling it's not like we haven't contributed. Um, that's what made it a little bit harder. Um, and it felt, for me, a little bit personal um, because there would have been no reason why he shouldn't have been selected from a young age to be competing internationally. I, I have to take British wrestling itself to one side because I love British wrestling, always have done. Um, served it as a child, as an athlete, served it as an adult in terms of his administration represented it during the 2012 Olympics. I have no issue whatsoever British wrestling itself as an institution. Um, however, um, British wrestling used to be based in London. It was in London for a long time. Um, and without getting too deep into the politics of it, overnight it was uprooted and it was transferred to Manchester, um, which is fine. Manchester's as important a city as London, I recognize that. Um, but the problem was it then alienated a lot of the talent that was available in the London area because London is, is much more ethnically diverse in terms of it's very rich culturally in people that you have that come from many different countries that represent many different styles of wrestling. So when you're training an athlete in London, 
um, you have the ability to kind of expose him or her to a fantastic array of different cultures and different styles of wrestling. Wrestling has not is not what it is today compared to what it was in my day. In my day, if you were a GB athlete, you were a GB athlete. If you were USSR, you were USSR. These days, you tend to find names from lots of cultures representing countries where, I guess if you look at it, you can see the origins weren't from that place. You see that it's become more about the medal count, I guess, than the athleticism of, of the athletes. Um, so being in London, I think, was would have been a fantastic opportunity to grow British wrestling. Why Cyrus wasn't really selected, I'm not sure if it was a kind of a drive to try to, um, I don't know, satisfy the different clans that someone representing that clan would be as part of, part of ultimately part of the team. The problem that you have, I think, with Cyrus is that his skill set is so advanced, his experience is so vast that there's probably not a, a top 10 wrestling country you could go to where they don't know who he is, simply because he has socialized, he's Im embedded himself into the culture of wrestling, and he's known by many Olympic associations across the world. In, in a way, I don't know whether that kind of intimidated or infuriated um, an association that simply couldn't meet the kind of exposure that he was getting. So when, when he was selected, um, by Wales, I think, to represent them. The difficulty was they didn't even want to give him a tracksuit. It, it may not seem like a lot, but if you're an athlete, you'll understand that's quite important, knowing whose colours you're wearing when you're entering a tournament. Um, you know, their, their comments afterwards were frankly disgusting to come from someone that doesn't even have a wrestling background, is from another sport altogether, not even from wrestling, and totally decided to, you know, I don't know, ignore the fact that his wrestling pedigree is above anybody else within the BWA or the, the British Wrestling Association. Um, and rather than celebrate that fact, he's penalised for it. He's penalised for the fact that he's a third generation wrestler. I mean, even as we try to explain, in, in, in an environment where we battle for funding as a sport, it's a very underrepresented sport, I get that. Um, you know, we're never going to be the rowing or the cycling or the, you know, the canoeing or the things that are very high profile. But he has such a great story that it would have been a great story to have kind of projected and put out there, but he wasn't. He's been repeatedly excluded, he's been repeatedly penalised. Um, we've had endless dialogue with them to try and establish what is going on. Um, but it's the same people that seem to be selected, that don't achieve what they should achieve. He's then denied the opportunity and when he is given an opportunity, he's not given the opportunity to prepare for the opportunity they've presented him. So he'll be sent off to a tournament, you know, with barely a week's sort of notice. I and mean, that, that's what makes it difficult because um, he's excluded and he's, and he's such a fantastic role model. He's a great role model for, for, you know, for young men, young women, young boys, young girls that want to come into the sport. To, to not be kind of showcased, to not be highlighted. Um, you know, when, when the moment comes when he is, maybe that will be the moment for him to perhaps ask those questions. Why, why was it the case? Why wasn't he showcased? Why wasn't he sort of selected and given the opportunity? Because all he's ever asked for is the opportunity to demonstrate those skills that he's acquired over a period of time by himself. You know, not, not as much as I'm grateful and thankful to his sponsor, as, as much as I know it's been hard work just feeding the young man, let alone taking him around everywhere, 90% of it, his credit is to himself because he's the one that wakes up in the morning at 4 a.m. and goes into the gym. He's the one that spends those two hours every morning perfecting his routine, then going to do a full-time job, and then coming back and then teaching a class and then training again. He's the one that does that. So no credit that I could even dream of taking is, is ever gonna replace you know, the monumental effort that that man is making himself to perfect his skills. So when he's asking for an opportunity, that's all he's asking for, is give me a chance, let me show you how good I am. Even with the Commonwealth, I was the only athlete who had to pay to go. They made, they made me pay a thousand pounds to represent my own country in the Commonwealth game. None of the other team members had to pay to go because they really didn't want me to go that much because of that fear. And the worst thing is, is by them not sending me, they're losing and I'm also losing. If I win, they get money, they get help, the rest thing gets noticed more, but because they can't control me, they're just like, you know, I just don't want to deal with them. It came to a point, like I said, where after the Commonwealth wasn't being selected, I wasn't being helped, I wasn't given funding. Like they have certain members on the team 
who have gone to like 10 European championships since they were like 14 years old. I've gone to one. And even the one I went to, they told me on Friday, yeah, if you don't sign this medical form by, by Sunday evening, then you can't go. And I'm literally in the opposite end of the country. I'm like, how am I supposed to get back, see a doctor, get him to sign it all in 48 hours? It's not fair. But they asked me with the intention of knowing that he can't go anyway, you know, and then in the end, I managed to go with one month notice. You know, not like him, we've had that like six month or the other six month notice to get ready and train, one month notice. And the two guys who they predicted to get medals or gold medals in the Commonwealth didn't medal at all. I was the least likely, to, uh, I was told I was least likely to medal, which is why I had to pay to go and I ended up meddling. And the guys who they, who they had all their money and whatever didn't end up meddling. You know, so it's just, you know, if I'm honest with you, bullshit, you know. But it came to a point where things got that bad after the Commonwealth because I wasn't being funded or being selected. I was potentially going to wrestle for the Portuguese national team because my ex-girlfriend, she was going to marry me to get me citizenship, to get me a passport. She she was so sick and tired that I was waking up just crying every day. I was just upset because I was like, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how good I'm getting, I can't win because I'm not, I'm not actually allowed to go to the competition to prove my point. So even with all this hard training, everything I'm doing, it's like not, it's not meaning anything because I don't get to actually show it off. So she was like, you know what, let me help you. Um, I'll marry you to get your Portuguese passport. Just find out from the Portuguese Wrestling Federation what you need to do on, what you need to do on their end to get into the team. So I found the coach, I emailed him, I messaged him and he, and he said, look, if you come to Portugal and win our national championships in freestyle and greco Roman wrestling, as soon as you get your passport, we'll give you your own flat, we'll pay you monthly and we'll train you for all time. So I went over, I beat everyone 10-0 and like with the V's, because Portugal is, isn't that strong for us, then they said, look, hurry up and get your passport. As soon as you get it, we'll let you go to every competition and we'll pay for everything. So I tried that method. And then while this was going on, um, I spent a lot of time in uh, uh, Colorado Springs, where the Olympic Training Center is. And I was training with the US uh, National Army team. And what they said to me is, look, if you, um, if you win a major UWW tournament or you beat our best guy here, we can guarantee you citizenship within six months and you can wrestle for the US Army full time, but only in Greco-Roman wrestling. So before my boss got involved, they were my two options. So I thought, you know what, after the Commonwealth and all that stuff was going on, I had literally had, had no job, I had, I had no money. I literally had like nothing. And I thought, oh, I need to find some, some sort of backup. Um, and I uh, applied for the position at Price Building Services for now my sponsor, which I'll go on to tell you about. And what happened was in the application, there was just like, tell us why you want this role. And I thought, you know what, like, fuck it, I'm just gonna be honest. So I told them, I said, look, I need this qualification. I need it as like a backup if I get injured. But if I'm honest with you, long-term, I don't know if I want to be a film installation engineer, but I want to wrestle, I want to go to the Olympic Games and I want to win, but I need something as a sort of backup to help me do, do both. Believe it or not, as soon as I sent that, that uh, application or letter, someone called me 10 minutes later saying, yeah, we're, we're really interested, come and meet us for, for, uh, for an interview. See, and uh, this interview, it wasn't even a, a job interview. The guy literally, who's my manager now, Chris, he was talking to me about the Commonwealth Games. He didn't, even, he didn't even tell me anything about the job. The only thing he asked me, because do you know anything about family insulator? I said, no, but he goes, oh my God, you went to the Commonwealth. How was it? You know, how did it feel to represent your country? That's really cool. And at the end of that conversation, he goes, you know what? Do you want the job? And I was, I was like, oh yeah, of course. And then I explained people my story about, you know, how I'm unfunded, I've had to work and train, and now like, I'm, I'm doing this apprenticeship to supplement my, my like resting, basically. Um, and if I want to move to another country to, to train where there's better partners and stuff, I can work and do that in the same way and whatever. And one of the guys I was speaking to thought, oh, you know what? I think the, the owner of Price Building will actually sponsor to you. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, no, let me um, talk to him and I'll let you know what he says. Yeah. And then long story short, my, my boss or now uh, Mr. Varian Price, he comes up to me. Obviously, when you think of a boss, you think of a, like you think of a guy in a suit and all whatever. He's cut, some some guys come up to me, little jeans, polo, and like trainers. I thought he was late for work, and he goes, "Oh yeah, what what are you doing here?" And I explained to him my story about the Commonwealth and you know of how I've, I've been unfunded and you know I want to go to the Olympics but I can't afford to go and all the politics and whatever. And all he said to me was like, "Look, son, you know don't worry about any of your finances. I'm going to cover it all. Just focus on winning that medal." And then just walked away. And obviously, I went pale. 
I didn't know what sort of happened. I looked at my friends like, did he, did he really mean that? And I, I'm like, literally, even now you can see it's like, you know, it still ain't affected me. Literally for like 14 or 15 years, I've tried to find someone to actually believe in me and take me seriously. And in a 10 second conversation, the man gave me everything that I needed. And he didn't even like know me like that. And then since then, you know, I've had no fear of anything because my other problem besides the politics was obviously finance. Like, I couldn't afford to go to competition. Now, I don't have to worry about that. My my boss, he gives me time off to go and train and compete. He understands and he just lets me um, get on with it. So now my only focus is, is uh, just to win. Obviously, there's the political side of being selected, but I'm not really bothered by that because once I win enough competition, people are going to know who I am. That's what I was saying to you about becoming the face of British wrestling. They're going to have to select me. People are going to be like, where's some Zid? So Zid, um, we, we run a mechanical business and we've got a great apprenticeship scheme with um, the local colleges, and what have you. So um, Sid was a product of that. He came through the, the thermal insulation scheme. Um, he then came into our fabrication shop where we do all our manufacturing. He got he learned a lot of hands-on skills there. Um, and yeah, and then after that, he spent a good year in the fab shop and then we sent him out to the big sites, i.e. Like Battersea and that type of thing. But during that time, um, we discovered that he was obviously hardworking, um, able, you know, and humble, and, and he fit into the team really well. So if Sid decided, or, or if he got to that point where um, he sadly had to say goodbye to Price Building Services because he needed to go full time, again, we feel like we've done our job, you know, we've enabled that. It'd be, it'd be a bittersweet thing because we'd be sad on one hand to see him go um, and big, some big boots to fill, but on the flip side of that, he's fulfilled his dreams and we've had a hand in that and we would take some pride in that as well and, you know, wish him well and continue to sponsor and support him. But so yeah, I mean, it's a long mate continue. It's a, a great working relationship. You know, we give Sid the time off and the um, that he needs to to obviously train. And as you as you said a minute ago, he's like he's up training before work. You know, while we're, while we're all still in bed, he's up training. You know, and then he comes to work, puts in a shift, and then he'll have another class, um, or he may have to travel or something. But you know, it, it, it works well. We're, we're very um, supportive and versatile. I don't think many companies would sort of give you that sort of time off and that freedom at our own expense. But you know, he's worth it and um, he applies himself and he, he's a great, humble, down to earth guy, you know. This is where some people would, would quit because, you know, you get your knockbacks, you win a medal at the Commonwealth and then there's one step forward, two steps back. You get hit with a bill from the, the Team GB for whatever it is or there's there's another financial implications or um, it's always a stumbling block and, and, you know, there's always challenges in life and it, Sid's got the right attitude and you keep plugging away and you will get there. You know, there's no quitting that guy and, and there's no quitting us as a business. So um, it's, that, it's that mentality, I think, plays a big part in it. Um, but yeah, you just got to keep going and knocking those barriers down. So obviously it's a, it's a two-way street like anything, you know. One, of course, we're just happy to see a, a young man, a young athlete fulfill his dreams and be a part of that. But obviously what comes with that is, is he's representing us as well. So, you know, he's at the top. It's like um, two peas in a pod, you know. I like to think that Price Building Services are at the top of our game. You know, we've got some big contracts in London, some big projects and he's the equivalent of us in the wrestling world, you know, so I think it's a fairly good match. I literally thought from, from seven years, years old, it's going to be, yeah, win the Nationals, win the European, win the World, win the Olympics. But my path, like I said, almost getting married for a Portuguese passport, then wrestling potentially for the States, you know, having no money, having like not being practically homeless, you know, uh, working in, an, in, a, in, a, in a crappy job where my boss won't give me any time off or support my dream at all, to, to now, you know, having full support from from my uh, boss and my work and my sponsor, my coach Gogo doing everything he can to send me to these competitions anyway. Like, you know, I'm I'm very, very lucky. But it took a long time to kind of get to that point. Like, I, if I'm honest with you, when you ask me about being in like a bad place, up until that point, everything was in a bad place. You know, I've, the only person I have to thank other than that is my dad, because my dad was the only other person that has to justify how good I was and he always would, would try and help. You know, would always like, you know, pick me up, take me back to training, you know, get me food. You know, but besides him, I don't really have anyone else to thank. It's literally when the day I get my Olympic gold medal, it's just my dad, you know, Mr. Price and, and, um, and Nagogo.